Thomas Romani. Uh, our first uh, guest tonight is, uh, is a bit of an unusual uh, uh, company presenting. Uh, I think they got their start at uh, uh, MPAX, the uh, recent uh, Zoom hackathon. Uh, I'm sure uh, they'll be happy to tell you more. Uh, please give a warm welcome um, to Billy Irwin and his crew from uh, Bolts, formerly known as uh, Chaos Man. We've got a guitar and an and a speaker hooked up. So basically what we're doing is taking an iPhone and changing the way that music is, just in general, is big word, right? Um, so electric music is a huge thing right now, and it's expensive. You have tons of foot pedals, or, or there's tons of you know, uh, different kinds of effects, like processors that are $500, $20 in effect, you know, really expensive things. So basically what we're doing is we're making a real-time effect processor, just on the iPhone. So you have guitar into iPhone, into uh, speakers, and it sounds like. We can have X, Y, and tilt coordinates. So there's multiple effects in the chain that you can uh, deal with at any given time. And you talk about more like our feature and the interface. I know you love it. Really. All right. So the real beauty of this app is it takes all the effects that all the hardware that already exists and puts it all in one place. You know, guitarists right now they have a full pedal. They have, um, they have to like just mess with the source on the amp. There's all these different things that they have to set to play the songs. And the beauty of our app is we can program that entire thing into just one iPhone app. And you just open up a menu, you set the effects you want, you set if you want them to be controlled by using the X or Y coordinate, or if you just want to set a constant level, you close the menu and then your guitar is ready to go. Um, it's a really easy to use interface. You can customize it to whatever you want. Um, we're tailoring it both for experienced guitar players so that they can do all the little minor tweaks that they'd be able to do with regular hardware. Or we have, uh, we're going to have custom settings so that if someone who's a really inexperienced guitar player just opens up this app, they can just place a few effects and they're good to go. Uh, one of the big problems right now with a lot of the guitar apps for phones is that they're really uh, hard to use for people like myself who I dabble with guitar and I went and opened up an app and I was like, I don't really know what I'm doing right now. So that's one of the beauties of our app is it's really easy to use. You open it up and right off the bat it's guided to be able to figure things out. Yeah, like Billy was saying, what we're doing basically is really lowering the boundaries of creating new, exciting electronic music, right? So electronic music has kind of been the new hit thing. Um, we've got the, the Muse, um, we've got uh, people like the Black, Key, uh, Black Keys, and different bands are moving toward this electronic music, which is very expensive to produce. So this just lowers that boundary, so you can just fool around and make electronic music to you know, have the quality of using it, uh, maybe experimenting with it until, even if you don't need it, but like, very expensive hardware, you don't want to just go into that without, <laughs> you don't want to go into that without at least experimenting with it first. So this is really lowering the boundary for new cool electronic music and kind of changing the way that guitarists think about writing songs. Uh, so I think Joe's just going to play a little bit more music for you guys because it's awesome. Um, and that's really all we've got for you, so thanks. Thank you. 
the first presentation that I forgot to announce the event. Uh, if you are looking for HD Tech, you're in the right place. Uh, the general format here is that we have um, five companies present for uh, five minutes, and then they get it to do a, a five minute uh, Q&A. Uh, and I'm your uh, host, uh, Zach Steiner from uh, OR. Uh, and so now we want to open it up to uh, uh, basically your questions uh, for these guys. Uh, about their product, about their company, that sort of thing. Uh, and we have five minutes. Um, when you ask your question, please hold down the little red button on the uh, microphone. It'll light up, and then it'll go through the uh, the AD system so everyone can hear you. So who, who has the first question? What's your business model? What's it cost? Um, so we're still playing with it around with the idea right now. Uh, we're about right now. We've been working really hard to get it ready for the app store, and our general. Consensus what we're doing is we're going to release it for free with three or four of the effects on there And then you'll have to pay Either a dollar or two dollars for every other effect that we ever create Are you trying to differentiate yourselves from like iRig or Beyond pads or a lot of, there's a lot of symbols. I mean there's a lot of iPhone or smartphone music effects apps um, Well you mentioned two different products, but the main difference between us and iRig is that um, you can, obviously I have the iPhone on my guitar, I can you know, use it to mess with the effects in real time like while I'm playing. I mean, we only demonstrated one effect right now um, because we're working on a lot of other ones, but we've got, uh, you can use each axis to control an effect. We also have it where you can uh, tilt the guitar to control an effect, and we've been working on some other options as well. So that would be the difference between us and like iRig or most of the uh, iPhone guitar type situations, and then with the actual Chaos Pad that you physically install, obviously the big difference is this is almost free, um, and it's really easy to have it installed. Yeah, just on that, uh, Chaos Pad that you install runs from like four hundred to like two thousand so. dollars. Yeah. Um, okay, who who are you selling this to? And if you're trying to sell it to professionals. How do you overcome the fact that a lot of professionals like things like old warm tube amps and they like their pedal board and they would, you know, they'd never touch a Line 6 amp or a Line 6 pot or anything like that? Well, I, it depends on, like, you know, there's a spectrum of different people that we might be talking about here. Uh, obviously, there are some diehard guitarists who would never you know, step away from the certain pedals that they, they've been using their entire lives. Um, but we've been working really hard with the uh, the code for the, the all the sound processing processing to make sure it's it replicates you know what's actually available and what guitarists are already using, um, and we're just doing our best to make sure that we can replicate those warm tube sounds, those realistic analog sounds that guitarists are interested in, as well as the digital digital type of effects that newer uh, electronic musicians might be interested in as well. Just, you know, how much does the, the dongle cost, and how are you going to get it to somebody if they're paying for free, not giving you the information? So oh. getting free. You mean, oh, so you install the app on your phone, and then a, what I'm doing right here is I attach the phone to my guitar using Velcro tape. I mean, there's a couple different things you could do there, um, but the app itself is free, um, and then users can download more effects uh, after they've got it. So. That's anyone who has an iPhone can use it. How, how, the, part, the patch cable goes into that little white box. Oh, right, right, right. Um, sorry. Um, so there are several different uh, devices on the market whose purpose is allowing people to plug their iPhone into the guitar. Uh, or, sorry, the guitar into their iPhone. This is a, the cheapest option called the PBM kit, so $10 to $15. Um, there's the iRig, which you mentioned. That's like $30. There are a few different options, and the user would have to have something like that in order to be able to use this. What is uh, uh, battery life uh, on an iPhone? How long, how long is it going to last? Um, I mean, most iPhones generally, according to Apple, last about like 8 to 10 hours with constant use. Um, I don't really know that many people that would play guitar that long. I mean, like, I feel like most people aren't gonna play guitar like 10 hours straight. And like a big thing is like this product is designed for, I mean, hobbyists would probably be like our biggest, like people just who play guitar, but you know, 
they might be in a band or something, but you know, I mean, they're not really playing on like a national scale. And it just it gives them the opportunity to use all these effects that professionals pay thousands of dollars for, and they only have to pay you know twenty dollars total, including like getting the app and maybe like a cord to hook up the guitar to a computer, which they probably already have because a lot of people like iRigs are a very um, popular thing for people to buy. I think we have time for one more question. If there's one more question in the in the audience, or it was my understanding that uh, the app model through the iStore uh, required that when you reduced it at a certain price point, all the further upgrades were free. So how are we going to sell the add-on functionality? Right. Uh, so it's not like you don't upgrade to new versions. There's actually in-app purchases for different effects. So it wouldn't be like you have to download an entirely new version of the app. It would just be that. As in that purchase, you could unlock it. All right, thank you guys so much. Oh, I guess uh, Wilson, would you mind uh, taking taking this stuff down, or do you mind just leaving it up here? Or, I mean, they're going to use this. Oh, okay. Sure. Uh, yeah. Maybe this is where we're going to add just so it's Okay, uh, while they're doing that, uh, is, it anyone, uh, is this anyone's uh, first HD tech? Is this the first time that you, you've ever been to an HD before? Oh, awesome. Okay. Usually we're upstairs, uh, and I believe next month again we will be, we will be upstairs. Um, but there was a, uh, a, a potential conflict that the university thought there might be. So they uh, uh, moved us down here for, uh, for this week. Um, and actually, that's a perfect segue to uh, thank our sponsors. Um, uh, there's two of them. Uh, H2 Geeks uh, is sort of a, a meta organization in Arbor that helps put on a lot of uh, entrepreneurial and uh, geek-minded uh, events. Um, uh, it helps uh, sort of uh, give groups of people the organizational skills that they need to to host uh, events like uh, H2 Tech, uh, Ignite in Arbor, that sort of thing. If you're interested, uh, check out the website, h 2 uh, And then also our uh, venue sponsor, the University of Michigan uh, Law School Entrepreneurship Clinic. Uh, has been very kind to HTV Tech, uh, both in helping host uh, uh, startup drinks and, uh, and uh, letting us use uh, their space to uh, tell us this event. Uh, okay, so I guess without further delay, uh, our next presenter uh, is uh, Royal Recraft. I'm Eric Shea, the founder of Recraft, a, product, a water reuse product company. So industry are using the water resources inefficiently right now. This is both economic as well as an environmental problem. How many of you guys drink beer? Do you know for every one bottle of beer you consume, five bottles of water is being used in the production process. And this is not just regular water we're talking about. These are nutrient polluted water that's charging a medium sized brewery like Bell's $600,000 a year to dispose of this kind of water. That is 10% of their annual revenue. When we look at things in the US scale, this is causing the entire industry with about 100 craft breweries, $100 million a year. So what we have here is a model of what our solution to this would be installed on a brewery such as New Holland Brewery. And this is the ReCraft product. We have photo, or starting at the very top, we have photobioreactors which treat 80 to 90 percent of the nutrient polluted water that Eric referenced to. So those are the green things that you saw on top of the roof. And then finally, all the way over there, next to Pauline, we have a biodiesel refinery that produces 100 percent pure biodiesel which can then be looped back into the brewery to cut down their energy costs. So this is an energy solution to a water problem. And what makes us really unique is that we have a loopback system that allows us to recycle a byproduct from the refinery process and use it to fatten the algae right here. <coughs> this allows us to double the oil production within that, thereby doubling the biodiesel output, finally dramatically reducing the brewery's energy costs. So to go a little bit into who we're actually targeting for this type of solution. So Eric talked about the breweries and that the charges that are being placed on them because of nutrient-rich water. In addition to that, while we were out talking to breweries across Michigan, we came up with three different things. They're economically minded. These are smaller companies we're talking about. They're sustainably minded. People are already putting money towards clean tech, such as solar panels, to hopefully later down the road reduce their costs. Finally, they are a tight-knit and friendly community. Being able to talk to these companies, they've been able to provide us feedback with our solution. In addition to the network and the tight community, brewer associations and conferences, craft brewer conferences, are places that we would be able to travel to to actually get the word out of our products. 
So real quick, this is Tim Faith. He's the brewer at New Holland Brewery talking about our product. And I'm also in charge of the sustainable measures around here. Uh, we are taking an interest in fuel crafts endeavors and we would like to continue working with them. So after speaking with Tim, we spoke with his boss, Mike Dubois. Mike Dubois was telling us that the most important aspect of actually installing a product like this is the payback period. It must be between five and eight years for them to actually be able to install it and for, it does not necessarily actually talk about the cost. And so here if we were to install New Holland with our product, then the payback period would be six years. The total cost to install it, which includes the unit as well as installation, is $310,000 and the savings per year for New Holland, mind you, New Holland is a smaller brewery, would be $63,000, and this is after annual maintenance costs. And so to look at what else could Tim actually put into his system. He could do traditional treatment systems or anaerobic digesters, or he could look at something like Elva Scientific. Elva Scientific is algae fermentation, where they take out the nutrients of the water, but the byproduct that they create cannot go back into Tim's brewery. Instead, it is chemical feedstock. We are brewery's best solution. So when we're talking about this, the production level of beer is going at 10 to 15% a year. What they're looking for is a water reuse system that's modular. And we are one of the only systems that can grow as an industry grow. Second is, because we're solving two inefficiency with one solution, one in water, one in energy, we're one of the most cost efficient clean energy systems out there. So what are the other alternative market for a system like this? We talked to a sustainability director in Ann Arbor, and the potential application for this is on a site like landfill, where we can clean the water, groundwater that's being polluted by the landfill, as well as generating biodiesel to empower the Ann Arbor City's public transportation. And actually, since I have 30 seconds, we'll add on another one, another, another point. We just lost the Michigan Clean Energy Venture Challenge. It was a great competition, we learned a lot, but one of the questions that they, they always asked us was, you didn't prove to us at the, at the presentation. And the engineering side of us just went, oh, well, all these are tested, you have existing patents, existing products. What we realized is they, they couldn't imagine that a group of students can actually produce biodiesel two times faster than the leading one. And the reason is we're not, because we're not using it on the energy industry, we're using it in the water industry. And because of that, this can actually be a really cost efficient system. Thank you. Questions from the audience. I know I have some too, but let's start with the, the audience first, I guess. Yeah. yeah why did you start? Or why are you deciding to start or make the first product uh, targeted toward craft uh, beer uh, brewing? So we actually did it. Even though we're college students and then we love beers, <laughs> that wasn't our first logical choice. What we realized is um, we're passionate about sustainability. We have something where it cleans water and generates energy. So we need to go out and find a customer that actually care about both. And breweries happen to be that. We also talked to other players like Cole Process and some implants, and they're not nearly as interested. Yeah, a big part of choosing breweries after a lot of different customer discovery rounds was truly part of their culture was very open to something like this. This isn't necessarily a behavior change because they're already implementing a lot of sustainable measures. And so it was a great go-to-market strategy for us, um, or potential go-to-market strategy, which will hopefully lead the way of proving that and moving on to other markets. Yes. I don't think you too much proprietary information. Like, what is the mechanics of filtration, I believe? Like, I mean, I so, um, yeah, I can go back. To filter it, um, in the, at the very top we have photobioreactors, which are essentially just these big, long plexiglass tubes in which the algae grows. The algae has a residence time of about four days in which it's able to treat the water. It uses the nutrients, which is how it's able to take out all the take out everything from there. And so actually the photobioreactor is not proprietary technology. These exist. Uh, most of the parts from our system is already existing technology that's being used in the biodiesel space right now. However, because it's being used for energy and it's not able to produce a significant volume, that's why it's unprofitable. But when we apply it, like Eric said, to this water problem and use our IP of being able to double the amount of oil content, that's how the system becomes so effective at having a six-year payback rate. Yes. So what is your profit on the 300K? So we're selling this system to the brewery. 
Yeah, so oh, how, margin? What's, what's your margin on it? What's your cost? 32%. 30%? 32%. 32%. And, and what's the largest scale that you've done with this to sort of prove it at this point? Um, we, so what we did was we have we used the chemistry data from the New Holland breweries and then do a model run with the livestock assessments and have the engineering so kind of the calculations. So you haven't so, even built it in testing yet. Correct. That is our next steps for this summer. Right now we've been working on this just for a couple months. Um, going forward into the summer is actually going to be acquiring lab space and um, working right now or working to get a test brewery, hopefully New Holland. And so the summer we'll be able to do a small actual pilot test as well as work in the lab. Now, all these parts within the system right now is being used in the biodiesel industry already. So you are relying on photosynthesis to suppress CO2 and generate diesel? Yes. Um, so how will the sunlight actually affect the whole system and does it work well in Florida as well as in Michigan? So we actually take that into consideration and when these engineers are doing the calculation, they took the, industry, um, the Michigan sunlight and that will decrease the, the uh, production rate a little. So if these things are in um, Arizona or places like that, the, the profit would be higher. But since we love Michigan, we love beers, we want to see them in the place. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What's your ask? What are you asking for tonight? What we're asking here is we, what we learned most from our failures last time at the competition, which I wouldn't even call it a failure, is we learned a lot from the mentors and advice. So please, after this thing, introduce us if there's anyone you know in the energy, energy industry, or just grill us, like question us. We want more feedback, we want more mentors, and we want to see what you guys think about this idea. My understanding is that you did some on-site testing with a brewery in Ypsilanti. I don't know if you're at Lindy discussing the details of that. Sure. No. No, we have no, no we haven't. We haven't done that. Okay, not done that. Yeah. Yeah. We've got the chemistry data, but we haven't. We've, we've been stealing their wastewater. <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> haven't stealing their wastewater. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So technically, we've been doing testing. <laughs> so I, we hop on a pickup truck and crawl on the roof tattoo. Oh, with, with their with their with the supervision of <laughs> And then we've been doing a lot of customer discovery, physical customer discovery. <laughs> <laughs> Why not just take the the waste water and do it offsite at your own facility using this technology versus building it actually at the brewery? Because right now the money that's being charged for this is calculated based on the discharge going in at the brewery site, not at the wastewater treatment site. So the idea of using wastewater treatment to produce biodiesel has been not been new. A lot of people have been proposing this. But because treatment, I mean treatment centers are not being charged for nutrient rich water, so they wouldn't install a system like this. Okay, thank you guys so much. same time. Uh, one is Nerd Night at the Last Word. I don't know, if, is anyone he, from here represent or familiar with Nerd Night? My understanding is that it's like 25 minute talks about things that uh, people are interested in. Um, I don't know more. Uh, I think uh, if you search uh, on Facebook for uh, Nerd Night, there's more information. Also, uh, Coffeehouse Coders is starting back up uh, this year. Uh, they're, they're moving now to uh, Palmer Commons. Uh, so if you go to coffeehousecoders.org, uh, it's a great place to uh, learn a new programming language. Uh, there's lots of people who are sort of learning programming together. Then we have questions. It's very easy to ask other people uh, your questions, that sort of thing. Uh, okay, so up next is uh, Humbling. Thank you. All right, hi, everyone. My name is Dave Wheeler. I'm an MBA student at the Ross School of Business. Uh, my name is Will Burgers. I'm a physics major at MSU. And uh, together, we're uh, Thumbblade Interactive. We make uh, games for the iPhone and Android platforms, and uh, we'd like to talk to you today about um, our experiences uh, producing apps and releasing them on different platforms, in case you're maybe thinking of doing that uh, soon yourself, as well as the different monetization schemes we've used. Uh, when we began, we started with like 2D games that were only on one platform, and uh, over time, we've uh, moved on to more sophisticated 3D games that are using, um, that are on both they're both platforms. Uh, the, the main tool that we use is called Unity, 
which is a 3D engine that makes it really easy to um, release on different platforms. And once the uh, apps are out in the wild, we use Amazon Web Services to provide uh, in-app or to provide content and uh, track user data. So in order, sorry, in order to uh, release on multiple platforms, we need to be familiar with the different app stores, and they do have different philosophies. Uh, the iOS app store can have a kind of a long, very long review process. Usually, it's two to eight weeks. Uh, Android has none; you can release immediately. Uh, the trade-off, though, is that on the iOS app store, there's a new and noteworthy section. So when you are approved and released, you'll get thousands or tens of thousands of downloads without any marketing. Uh, Android doesn't have that. So often, your first day out, you might not get any downloads because nobody found it, uh, nobody heard about it. So you're pretty much on your own as far as marketing on Android. And you will see a typical download trend that results from that, where on iOS, you'll start with a huge amount of downloads. Um, and then it'll sort of taper off as it's no longer new. Uh, Android, you'll start with very few downloads and people discover it, or word of mouth spreads, it'll increase. Uh, we'd like to focus on, to talk about monetization on the latest uh, series that we've released, which is called Drive or Die. Uh, this is a, an arcade racing type of game where you uh, drive down a highway and try to avoid cars and other obstacles. Uh, the core gameplay hasn't actually changed that much between 1, 2, and 3. As you can see, the screenshots are similar. But what has changed are the different features that we have, like unlockables, as well as the monetization that we've employed. When we began, we mostly had a paid app where we charge a couple of dollars for, and uh, a free version that was uh, supported by advertisements. As we've moved, uh, as we've produced other games, we've kind of gone to a model where we give the app away for free, and we support this with advertisements and uh, have uh, purchases in game, like for uh, items like gold. And uh, here we see the result of that. And actually, this is for the entire Drive to Die uh, series. And uh, we see the app sales, which would be Drive to Die 1 and 2, only 10% of the income on iOS. Advertising from all three games is only 17%, uh, whereas in app sales, which only exist in Drive to Die 3, uh, are actually an astonishing percent of our income, uh, which sort of shows that the free with in-apps, people are much more willing to pay that way than to pay up front. Uh, and on Android, though, in-apps aren't as popular. Uh, also, Android, you can see by the area of the graph, that sort of represents the total revenue, so you can see it's smaller. Um, it's more equal with ads. And AppKey is actually, we have a sort of a partnership with them where they pay us for users who sign up through our app. And we think that's maybe one of the best ways to monetize on Android, someone like TapDroid or AppKey, someone you can partner with, because uh, the in-apps just, people don't buy them. And this is just looking at Drive i3, so you see it's even more dramatic, where 90% of our revenue comes from iOS, and only 10% from Android. Uh, this is the total amount of downloads. It's been out for about four months, something like that. Uh, and you see it's much higher on iOS, and not only is it higher, but each user uh, is worth more money. One of the challenges that we've had is getting the word out about our games and uh, advertising. Uh, as Will just mentioned, we have uh, really only um, you know less than five per, about five cents per download, and um, a lot of the CPMs on uh, sites like Google can be ten cents or more. Uh, what we've used instead is uh, social media, like posting to Facebook and uh, cross promotion, like. Uh, promotional banners when we release games. Uh, overall, what we found is that it's best to produce cross-platform apps if you can, whether it's Unity or some other platform. Um, Android just takes a little more time to get going than iOS typically. And um, if you have to pick a monetization scheme, in-apps uh, are a really good way to do that. Um, and uh, you know, anything to do you can do to increase engagement is a good thing to do. So with that, uh, we'd like to take some questions. Um, <clears throat> actually, I have two questions. The first one is, what what exactly are you doing with in-app purchases? Is Are they required to complete the game, or do they just kind of improve the experience somewhat? Um, they're not required to beat the game, but you get to a point where functionally they're required. Basically what we sell is gold. Um, so, you know, for $1 you can get 20,000 gold, or for, you know, $10 you can get 
you know, 200,000 gold, whatever it is, uh, up to $100 um, for 5 million gold. Um, and so the cars get more and more expensive. So you get better and better cars, harder and harder levels. It becomes where you, know, you could earn that money just by playing, but you know, it would take you weeks and weeks uh, to earn that much money. So then people you know, will choose to buy out of that to just get the best car by paying $10 or whatever. So the, the follow-up question then is, um, is, I mean, just in a really rough ballpark, what kind of uh, man hours does it take with this Unity engine to release a title like this? So it, it depends on, you know, heavily on the experience. Like, uh, and the kind of game, something like a puzzle game versus something with levels and, and you know, uh, enemies and things. Um, I would say, if I was just going to give a blind ballpark guess, I would say three to six months development time. Yeah. Um, and and purely in hours, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I don't know because we, we both do this. It's uh, so variable too, uh, depending on the game. Sure, and, and, I'm, and I'm more asking for your specific game. Oh yeah, yeah. obviously. Um, yeah, well, probably three to six months is probably pretty good at asking. Yeah, and when when releasing like a, a sequel, we often use like the previous version as a as a stepping stone. So the question is, is it worth it for you guys? It is to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, 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 it's a trade-off. Um, you know, I had a, uh, uh, I was doing consulting um, out, you know, outside of this uh, development, and um, <clears throat> you know, nominally this is you know less than than I'm getting from a full-time job. On the other hand, you know, one-time development. Uh, will you know lead to a, a revenue stream, and these things will taper off over time. But it's you know there's something to be said about having um, you know money that comes in every month, and so it's, it's it just kind of builds up over time slowly. And, and about that is have you guys done the uh, pay to play with regards to the position in the app store and building that awareness that way? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. You mean like advertising, promoting? What I mean by pay to play in terms of actually um, getting featured? Uh, um, no, I, we, we've never like paid for featuring. No, well, we, we, the thing is that originally we tried a few promotions um, and they were all just terrible. Uh, you know, we paid money and then we get some, some come, but then some, it's just too, you know, maybe 5% of people will keep the game, you know, and then maybe 5% of them will buy something. It just never works out for us, for our games to pay, you know, Facebook or App a Day, any of these people, it's, in our experience, it was just money down the drain compared to, you know, something like posting on Facebook or, you know, adding some feature. With much better returns from that kind of effort. What would have made AppKey the most effective monetization scheme? That's a complex question. Part of it, I think, is the relative, uh, on Android, people don't want to pay money. It seems, or, just yeah. demographically, they just seem less likely to buy new apps, less likely. So with AppKey, what we did was there's a car, um, and it's you can't use the car, but it says unlock by signing up for AppKey. So you click that and sign up, and then we get some you know cents for every person that does that. Uh, and I think it's just more attractive on Android. I think iPhone users are just more used to using their credit card and buying stuff. But you know it's hard to say because we can't we can't track each individual. We can just look at the percentages at the end. And you know a much smaller percentage of Android people buy stuff, um, you know, in our game. So, but, but yeah. Quick follow. So you did use it on iOS. Uh, AppKey didn't exist for iOS. Okay. Um, it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that could change the buying habits? It's, uh, I think like, it, like if it was available on on uh, iOS. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, it's it's um, it's kind of what we've seen is it seems to be like an additive effect, like. Uh, that you know, we, we really have only um, gotten more money out uh, with uh, AppKey than we have uh, previously. We, we had the game released for a while before we implemented AppKey, and it hasn't really changed the amount of uh, in-app purchases and advertising revenue that we have, but um, it has increased that. Well, I think it's clear who in the audience is uh, interested in mobile app development. Hopefully there'll be a great uh, follow-up discussion after those presentations. Thank you guys so much. Okay, so uh, we have uh, two more presentations um, uh, and then after.
after after uh, Brad goes, uh, I think uh, we'll open it up for a few announcements. Uh, so if anyone has uh, like a 15 second announcement they want to make, uh, an upcoming event, uh, something for hackers or for hustlers, that sort of thing, I guess uh, after after the Q and A session is done, just line up over here and we'll just try to you know work through them after the last presentation. Uh, okay, and so our uh, our second class presenter tonight is uh, Brad from uh, Astis. I think this is on a microphone. I think over there. Uh, it'd be a little better for the audience if you don't mind. Thank you. Do you really need it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So Americans prefer, recent polls have shown, cockroaches, root canals, and Donald Trump over Congress. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know why people research these things, but it's true. And it is, at least it shows a minimum amount of frustration on the political system. The particular problem that we're interested in is what we feel is a lack of real representation. Just ask yourself this simple question. So when was the last time any representative at any level, city, county, state, actually ask their opinion about some issue that matters to you. Unless you're arguing with Chet, Chet typically doesn't happen. Historically, we've used town hall meetings to solicit feedback. But those have proven to be inefficient, time consuming, they're not terribly representative, and often they're politically motivated. But it really, if you think about it, it shouldn't be that hard to figure out where a community stands on some issue. Especially given modern technology, and the fact that I really do think most people want to have their voices heard. As long as it's simple and convenient to participate, we should be able to build a modern political dialogue platform that connects us directly to our representatives. So how do we do it? A couple of ways. The first thing is we build, we give tools to our representatives that allow them to very simply ask us how we feel. So the first is building a sophisticated, free to use, polling platform. A representative should be able to very quickly find out how his or her community feels on some issue. Set up a question, press a button, and goes out to wherever you live digitally, and we all see the results. So for example, the dialogue currently about the skating rink on top of the library line. How does our community feel about that? Secondly, Governor Snyder, if he wants to know, does the state really support the bridge to Canada, it should just be so simple. It should show up on your phone, social network, email, web, wherever you live. You vote, and there you go. You see the results. Everybody sees the results. The governor sees the results. We see the results. We see where everybody stands. Simple, convenient, quantitative, and in its most basic form, that's representation. And of course, behind each poll is a deeper community-driven dialogue page containing public comments, official positions, dialogue, and more information. The platform is designed to work the other way as well. So if you're interested in asking questions of your representative, you submit the question, the community sees the questions, we vote basically on which questions you think are the most important, those service bubble up to the top, and the representatives respond. And of course that, those questions and the commentary around those questions also fall to that deeper dialogue page. So the platform is designed to be publicly owned. Basically, we're going to build the public good and give it to the people, kind of like Wikipedia. It's free to use, nonpartisan, open source, and our organization is a nonprofit organization. Look how awesome. So why do we think refs will use it? Well, I uh, know we talk to a lot, and honestly, they're pretty eager to get started. I mean, it's a great value proposition. It's robust technology, and the price is right. There's also, it also allows them to reach more constituents, because it's our organization really that's the, ones that, that's the one working on getting users on the system. And there's also some political motivation. If we build a simple polling platform, and you're an incumbent, and you don't use the system, and people want you to use the system, and that could lead to a little political peril later in your career. You know, even though it's a nonprofit, revenue is important. Is it self sustaining? And we think so. So the polling model is a premium model where more sophisticated polls will just cost money. 
There's clearly a lot of email marketing going on in this space, companies like Constant Contact, but we can do things like donation solicitation, and kind of at the end of the day, we're building a, a giant CRM tool. So the team, I'm Brad, founder. We have one full-time developer currently, a couple of part-time hackers, and one media relations person. So we're relatively small. And honestly, I didn't want to go today because I was hoping that the demo would be ready, but it's not quite done. Hopefully in a couple of days it'll be out there. We're planning on beta release in the spring before the big open democracy conferences in DC, and then GA, you know, who knows. So what are our needs? Okay, we're nonprofit. We're not really looking for funding from this group, but anybody interested in hacking towards transparency in government or want to get involved in beta testing, let us know. Questions? So, how do you prevent uh, abuse, either deliberate or through sampling error? Yeah, excellent question. So, uh, well, sampling error is a problem with any quality, but, and I mean, we're going to use the same techniques as, as you know, um, your standard polling platforms use. So, I mean, the point is, is to get, you know, at least as accurate as those. I mean, so for example, one, one Traditional polling platforms face this problem, right? 30% of the people are off the grid. So if you look, if you look at Kwame Kilpatrick's election a few years ago, I mean, it was predicted that he was going to lose by a landslide, in large part because the polling platforms only use phones, right? This platform is designed to use phones, but also, you know, newer technologies like internet and these things. How about uh, abuse? Abuse. Well. So the, the thought is actually to get three levels of votes. An anonymous user can come quickly with geolocation to see where you live. Hey, this person lives in our So that comes the question about the stadium. Uh, and that's, that's some value, right? And clearly we want to prevent that computer from voting twice, and that's pretty simple. But that's just an anonymous user, and, and people who are interested in the stadium could flood if we get that. But there's a couple of other levels, right? One are registered authenticated users. And, this, and the most important level, potentially, is, is somebody who, who verifies where they live. And that's kind of the key to, to most polling um, agencies. I mean, they use phone numbers because those phone numbers are, are associated with, with an address. But we can, it's not that difficult anymore to verify your address. So there's kind of three levels uh, for each poll. Um, how do you get politicians to play ball? For example, uh, if I were to ask a question, who wants to shut down the coal plant? And then I would ask the question, who wants to put 500 people out of work? You know? Yeah, so there's a couple of issues. One, how do you get representatives to sign up to these program? Maybe more important is the way in which it's phrased is important. The question is it can lead. I think you all realize that. So one of the thoughts is to have a group of linguists, specialists, and each poll can go out either the poll was designed by the representative, or it was kind of put through this filter to make it as neutral and as objective as possible. How, I mean, and then the second, the first question is, you know, are people really going to use it? Find out. I think so. We've got a lot of great feedback. A lot of people are using um, it. I reach probably once a couple, five times a year, I'll reach out to my representative via Twitter or Facebook, and they don't interact with me there. They treat those as broadcast mm -hmm. mediums. So how, why would they, I mean, of course, you got some interest there, but why would they actually interact on this platform and not just treat it as another broadcast medium? Well, it, it turns out that representatives are pretty neurotic about public opinion, but they typically use media to, to kind of ferret out viewpoints. So one way of looking at this is we're removing the middleman. We're giving them the ability to go out and do the research themselves. And we're also, since it's a public good, we're putting pressure on them to be accountable. So I, I do think people feel like their voices are heard. So if we get enough people you know, in the community, whatever that community is, raise their hand and say, this is simple. I mean, it's just not that hard to figure out if we want a $22 million parking structure or if we should get a $750,000 piece of art. Is that the end of the discussion? No, but it lets us all have a voice. Very simple. Um, so why aren't representatives using existing polling platforms for this? They're expensive. 
Traditional ones that we see, and most professional ones, if you do 400 poles, it can be between 12 and 17,000 miles. dysfunctional government system like Detroit at the moment, um, where the access to media like internet, um, or the wide access to media like internet for a lot of the Detroit natives doesn't exist. Um, how can you use this platform to account for that and get an accurate reading? You don't need people have phones in Detroit. You don't need a smartphone as well. So the phones will be accessible on dumb phones. I do think people have phones and everyone uses So there are competitors similar to what you want to do, and you're saying they're too expensive. What's going to be your operating costs to try and offer this as free? What's your magic there? What's the magic? Elbow oh, grease, no magic. Um, I mean, there's nothing else to say. I mean, so you're basically going to run out of luck with volunteers. Uh, no, no, that's not true. So we had a quick screen on the revenue streams. Uh, I do believe that there are other services we can sell over and above the kind of free polling system that representatives are interested in using. One of the things we've heard is nobody wants to have more than one technology system in their you know, organization. They don't want to stress their IT staff. So for example, and we all know, they're already spamming you. They're marketing to you. Right? So we can do that as well, and we can in fact do it much better because we have a much more targeted, or we have the ability to do that at a much more targeted level. Because we know, for example, you know, who's kind of voice their concerns on education, transportation, is that environment, those kinds of things. So we can do the targeting like constant contact uh, without, you know, at, at, at a much more accurate level. Thanks. Alright, well, I know we should set up. I know we have at least two people for the media announcements. Um, we're trying to keep it short so we can make sure that we can uh, get to everyone in the, the audience interested. Okay, good evening. I am here to represent um, Mobile Technology Association of Michigan. We are having an event for mobile application developers uh, and entrepreneurs where you can meet and network. It is on March 13th called Mobile Matchup. I will post detailed information on meetup.com. Um, and we have another class with John Ellis from Head of the Ford Developer Program. So, and it's free if you register and are cheap. At the door, it's $10. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Hi, I'm Ed Carlson, and I'm here representing Great Lakes Entrepreneurs Quest. It's a nonprofit in Michigan, and it's here uh, to provide a business plan competition to entrepreneurs. So it's a good way to get funding for your ideas and projects. Uh, it's, it's really focused on creating jobs in the state of Michigan with new ideas, new companies. Uh, we match you up with community resources, expert advice. You can assign a coach, uh, manage in town. There's capital. So there's quite a bit of involvement by the investor community from the state of Michigan and the GLEQ efforts. Cool. Hi, my name is Richard Mega, and I'm representing Challenge Detroit. How many people have heard of Challenge Detroit? Okay, they're having their second group starting up. You have to have your submission in by March 3rd. For those that don't know about Challenge Detroit, it's a being put on by the cooperative out of Birmingham, and they get uh, 40 to 50 people, put them up in the city of Detroit, you have your housing, they give them and find them a job, they give them and find them a coach, and in response for that, they it's a full 12 month program, and each month they're doing something back for Detroit. So, pass the word, uh, last year's been still very productive, um, but they're having their second. It's going to be closing on March 3rd, so pass the word. Thanks. Cool. Anyone else have uh, events coming up or no? Okay. Uh, maybe after the intro presentations. All right. Here's an uh, outpatient. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is James Dupesong, and this is Raj. Also on our team is 
Two more computer science students here at the University of Michigan, Jesse Dodgeby and Pete Cochran. Uh, I'll start off by saying I know a lot of us like multitasking while we watch presentations. So for all of you on your laptops, if you want to go to navigation.com right now, play with the site, um, you can see the functionality. Okay, so the idea for this site is it's a spontaneous trip planning site. Uh, a lot of people, they waste a lot of time and get a lot of headaches whenever they want to decide where it is they want to go. But instead, now Navigation offers you the ability to just decide where are you from. And then we provide you with nine different cool places to go, all at really great deals. We find the cheapest uh, flights and then we also match it up with hotels. It goes in and calculates it for you right here and we can see really easily that you can go to Chicago for three nights for just over $200. Uh, we've been live for a little under three weeks and we had close to 40,000 unique visitors already. Uh, yesterday we finally broke the 100,000 page views, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, currently, we're looking into making some huge improvements. We are investigating a GDS system like software licensing through Sable Web Services or ITA by Google so that we can go ahead and offer everything in sight. Right now, if you click on these links, it actually redirects you through the Expedia Affiliates Network. So our plans are to go ahead and be able to offer everything in sight as well as offering vacation packages. That way we can go ahead and upsell on tickets to fun events or restaurant bookings or like Uber taxi services and options like that. And that will give us a way that we can monetize. Um, Currently, I don't know if any of you are playing around on the site, we update every two hours, and most of these flights, there's only probably two or three seats available, so one of the great parts of having our own software means that we can guarantee that all of this is up to date, because then we can make updates a lot sooner. Uh, a few other just like layout kind of improvements that we're planning to do. Up at the top right now is just a drop down in order to select your origin. We want to go ahead and offer it so they like geolocates. That way it can show you your nearest airport. Um, we currently support only 50 airports. If you go on to the poll on our Facebook page, you can go ahead and suggest new airports. Uh, also through Twitter and Facebook you can also give us feedback on what it is that you like. Uh, I personally deal with all of the emails that come through Contact Us. I try to respond as soon as possible. Uh, we've already listened to a lot of feedback. Like for example, our drop down list wasn't originally alphabetized. I'm not really sure what you're thinking there, but after, after about five emails just flew in within the first few hours saying, why is this not alphabetized? We got the job done. So. <laughs> Alright, well, that's basically it. I invite you to go play around on the site. Um, our, we like to just keep the site simple and keep it clean, keep it pretty. Uh, because going on a vacation should be about relaxing. It shouldn't be about the stressful, like, headache planning event. It's, yeah, so, any questions? Services of the underlying, or do you own any of the content? I guess I, I missed that that element of yours. So every hour we scrape uh, Kayak and Expedia to get the best hotel and uh, flight deals, and so we're yeah we're aggregating deals from Kayak and Expedia and just looking after them. Although we already have had a couple of people contact us about the option for like vacation packages. And that would all be us then again, like going and finding them, like personalized services, um, so they could tell us what they're interested in, and then we'll go out and find what they're interested in. Two questions. Um, for these unique page views or visitors, yeah. what did that translate in terms of revenue? And second is, what is your ask here tonight? 
Okay, currently we're not making any money on the site, although we have next time we're tracking like the linkings so we know which buttons are clicked. Um, I think so. We the third, so uh, it's actually funny. The first time we viewed the main channel, it showed us that 99% uh, of the people on the site click book a flight. That was obviously wrong. Uh, turns out the people who book who click buy flights buy three to four flights. So about a third of our users end up pressing book flight. We're not tracking the actual sales since the purchases are done through Expedia. But once we get into their affiliate network, we'll get uh, three dollars for every single, around close to three dollars for every sale. Okay, but what are, but do you have any idea of what the value, the revenue value of the trips that have, that have, that people have paid for, that have, that have been a result of them actually coming to your site? Maybe that's a different way to answer the, ask the question. Okay, so one option is, as you said, Expedia and the affiliates network, they offer us $3 on flights and then 5% on any hotels booked through them. We also have had some hotel beta searches offer us 50 cents for every click uh, that like link through our site to them for any hotel not book and a dollar for every hotel book by linking through our site. So there's that option. Um, and I think about a third of our users will actually click on that link. But let me ask for a simple question. Here you've got Orlando for two hundred sixty-eight dollars. Yes. If ten people bought that, that's two thousand six hundred eighty dollars. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for how many people clicked on. So if you know the revenues that have been generated by people coming to your site, that's what I'm trying to get at. No, we do not have that information because they book it through Expedia itself. Second question is, what's your ask? Uh, our ask is that if any of you know any contacts in the travel industry or anything like that, right now we're just trying to learn a lot more. Um, I'm currently speaking with the CIO of Hawaiian Airlines, uh, so we do already have connections, but it always helps to have new connections. And another ask is that we want to get direct access to flights so we can query them ourselves instead of having to go through Expedia. Uh, we looked at one partner and it costed a uh, minimum of $500 a year. So if anyone has any, any better ideas, that was my day by my Google for like three or Isn't there an Expedia affiliate in, uh, in Ann Arbor? Some company that was bought by Expedia? <laughs> yeah. So you say, uh, you put, uh, this, this site is up running for about three weeks? Yeah, about three weeks. Uh, how many visitors? We have just under 40,000 unique visitors. And it's amounted to over 100,000 page views. For the three weeks? For three weeks, so yes. How do you get the people now? Uh, we've been featured in Lifehacker, Gizmodo, Forbes. Uh, we were named one of the top 16 best online resources for Valentine's Day by, <laughs> by Radius. Uh, yeah, so apparently they pitched us as like a romantic getaway. <laughs> <laughs> Which I guess that works, and we've also been named some websites, like Website Pick of the Week. Just, just a suggestion, uh, take a leaf out of Google's book and get rid of the big banner. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, do, has this company made an API public? Are you using that? Or do they have an affiliate program? Or are you guys just kind of guerrilla screen scraping? Uh, uh, Kayak and HPA both have API, so we're using both of them. So what's so what's the uniqueness to prevent anybody else from doing exactly what you're doing? Um, so I guess it's nothing to really prevent anyone from doing what we're doing, but we've already got a pretty good like traction already started. Um, we have had some people contact us directly saying, "Look, I already booked one flight for you." Um, the person I'm referencing is actually the CEO of a startup in Boston. And he said he's looking to book a trip for his entire team. And he was wondering if there's any options to have it personalized through us. So I guess it's a client-based kind of thing. Uh, my response time is usually close to immediate whenever people try to contact us. So people really appreciate that. Um, oh, it looks like we're out of time. If any of you would like to speak to us afterwards, though, I'll be happy to talk to you. Okay, I think that's it for us. Unless there's any other announcements that uh, people want to do. Uh, in Dunsong, 2-3, uh, we're hiring, so if you guys want to...
uh, marketing, sales, or any other job that we posted, job that we should come check it out. That's job.duosecurity.com, sorry, I'm mumbling. Um, also, March 1st at the Tech Brewery, we're hosting a day-long office hours event with um, Sarah Schmidt, she's one of the writers, or she's the editor actually of Bank County Detroit. So if any startups in town that are looking to get covered, um, Bank County Detroit, definitely stop by. Uh, we'll post details actually on the meetup site as well, so you'll be able to find your friends there. Hey, uh, John Cunningham. Uh, I just wanted to uh, make an announcement that uh, TechDown is uh, sort of relaunching their uh, acceleration services, and uh, there's a, a meeting uh, tomorrow, I believe, to, uh, to give uh, information. They're looking for teams of two or more. Uh, you don't have to relocate to Detroit, but you need to be committed to going down there and working out of TechDown for, I think, three months, and they're getting 10,000 bucks and access to a bunch of services. Awesome. Yeah, cool. Okay, um, so me and Dave are actually uh, taking a few semesters out of school. Uh, we're pursuing our own startup uh, called Market Logo, and we'd love to uh, get it. Like, we just think it's the best opportunity for us, and we'd love to talk to people, get advice. And, what are you doing? Uh, we're building, so we run all of our projects, we just like to make things really easy. And like one of the biggest problems we call right now is finding someone to take his textbooks and housing. So we built this site, Mark the Logo, it makes it really easy to sell uh, textbooks and really easy to buy tickets. And uh, we launched that and we're really like, excited that. Yeah, so we have traction at like three schools now and we're looking to, to kind of expand that now that we've seen that it's kind of like taken on uh, different places. Cool, awesome, thanks guys. Okay, last announcement? Go ahead. Does Anybody ha know of an individual who has done an e-business and is willing to help another startup in it? That's a perfect segue into the... If you do, uh, everyone's here. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's throw them up. <laughs> okay, well, thanks everyone. Take care. See you next time.